Well, great. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be part of this collaboration meeting and all of the diverse interests and uh, uh, science communities, communities that are represented here. So I'm here to talk about uh, a book that's in press now at the uh, Smithsonian Institution, should come out within uh, by probably by the beginning of next year, January 2020. And uh, it's, it's 25 chapters. It's uh, accounts and analyses of historical population cycles and crashes um, for many different northern species, caribou seals, walruses, whales, polar bears, etc. Um, and a key strategy of the book is to uh, look at this in more time depth um, mm -hmm. than is typical for uh, or possible in biological studies. And just to give you a, a quick preview of that, this is a reconstruction of caribou populations on the Labrador Peninsula from the 1830s to 1930s. And you can see several uh, sharp declines and then rejuvenations of the herd. And uh, let's see, let's get on this. There we go. Um, and so the case studies in the book are, you know, cover a lot of different land, sea, and ice environments in the north, geographic range, North Atlantic, North Pacific, and Arctic oceans. and uh, you see some of the study areas here, all the way from Svalbard to Sakhalin. And uh, the book overall, the uh, uh, studies are very interdisciplinary and they are pulling in data from indigenous knowledge and observations, biology, genetic studies, archeology, span ethnohistory, and a lot of uh, data from hunting records and uh, game management records. <clears throat> and a key, uh, Intellectual underpinning for all of this is uh, Christian uh, Vibas work, Arctic Animals in Relation to Climate Fluctuations. And uh, Viba took uh, catch statistics from Greenland on hunting and trading stations over a 150 year period. And he was able to perceive this, uh, these cycles of climate, sea ice, animal, and human interactions with historical pulses, uh, colder periods when the polar sea ice would come down um, and the evidence of cyclical warm and cold periods. And you can see what he was uh, talking about just from the, the cycles that are shown there from over the last thousand years from the Greenland ice core data. And so these oscillations and temperature uh, have big effects on the marine ecosystem, uh, the terrestrial ecosystem, and they're linked to uh, natural cycles, the North Atlantic Oscillation, Arctic Oscillation Index. And you can see, actually, I just also wanted to convey the idea that all this happens on several different time scales too. You can see those, uh, uh, of course, we have annual changes and uh, decadal changes, and those are more in the nature of the red warmer peaks and the lower, uh, you know, the colder peaks below. There are also centennial scale fluctuations, and there's boxed off area there of the medieval warm period in red, and then the uh, little ice age and then other other phases which may last several centuries and then of course we have really long cycles like the uh, uh, you know Pleistocene and uh, going into the Holocene and uh, this is just also uh, an example from uh, the uh, Pacific uh, this is the Pacific decadal oscillation and this is just this is a very interesting model because again you see uh, this in case uh, expressed in warm cold, weak, strong versions of this cycle. And during periods when you have really intense storms and low at pr atmospheric pressures in the North Atlantic, or in the North Pacific, um, it tends to actually, the cyclonic turning of those storms tends to pull warm water up uh, from the lower areas. And you see on the left uh, global diagram there, you see, well, the coastal waters of Alaska get a lot warmer during that phase. And then when the cold phase, that the whole storm system gets weaker and then you have colder temperatures. And that has big shifts uh, in, causes big shifts in the, the marine ecosystem. So we have these natural uh, cycles that we're concerned about and we were aware of, but of course there are also very strong historical indicators that humans in the Arctic have had significant impacts on animal populations uh, and that uh, anthropogenic or human caused factors need to be uh, really considered. Yes, and we'd ideally 
trace these through the whole course of the uh, Anthropocene, which is when people started having major impacts on the environment. And for the, uh, for the Arctic, uh, that certainly began in the 18th and 19th century with large scale commercial whaling and fur trade. And you can see here this uh, rather lurid uh, Dutch poster of the Arctic whaling industry in Greenland. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, using all of these, uh, in other words, there's also the, uh, I want, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the importance of subsistence harvesting to indigenous communities. And of course, that's going to be one of the strongest tie-ins to this particular interest group of uh, health and sustainable resources, uh, food resources in Arctic communities. So if we're using all of these uh, different approaches, uh, kind of asking questions like, you know, what roles have human, humans played in causing uh, population crashes and rain shifts in animals? Are the changes that we see today unprecedented historically? And how can we explain these crashes, uh, these population declines from different perspectives and different sources? Um, we can, we can talk about it uh, biologically in terms of um, top-down effects of human hunting uh, and also subsistence harvesting. We can talk about bottom-up effects uh, that where you have changes in the food chain that can be caused by uh, climate. We are uh, looking at um, multi-factor explanations in most of these situations often over decades or centuries of time. And also, I'm going to make the point at local scales, looking at subpopulations rather than kind of macro scales of the, the entire populations of caribou or polar bears, for example. And when you're working on the local scale, it's very effective because you can do a more refined historical analysis. And um, we recognize that both climate change and uh, human uh, impacts affect different subpopulations differently. So I just wanted to run through a few uh, chapters of brief case studies from the book just to give you an idea of, of the range of material. And I want to start with uh, Morton Melgar's, uh, he's a, a Danish archaeologist, his paper on uh, caribou seals, climate and man, stories of life and death in the Arctic, which is chapter two in the book. And on the left um, is a uh, showing uh, the west coast of Greenland, and these are actually representing different subpopulations of, of caribou. And uh, caribou have been on Greenland for 8,000 years or more, and they've gone through these repeated crashes and, and growth. Uh, and you can see that on the right. He's indicating from about 1750 up into uh, the present, peaks and declines in the caribou populations for these different uh, areas of Greenland. And uh, this is very much connected to Viva's work. He's, he's talking about how these cycles match these decadal warm and cold phases uh, from the North Atlantic Oscillation. And uh, Melgar does, of course, recognize that people are also hunting caribou and that they may have had some impacts on these populations, but probably relatively minor. Um, he found that uh, uh, when you have uh, crashes, uh, declines in population caused by changing uh, climate, warmer or colder phases, the caribou tend to retreat up into their breeding uh, grounds, up in the, in the uh, higher ground, and then to repopulate out on the landscape. And he, he followed this, uh, so this is historical data. This is actually, you know, hunting data as such as Viva was using to make these cycles that you see on the graph. But then he also worked at a very important uh, archeological site. It was a big hunting site and was able to uh, uh, trace, this was in the uh, Sis Sisamute area and was able to trace these layers of caribou bones in the archeological midden and see that in period time periods that exactly corresponded with the population cycles for Sisamute, people were occupying this site and they were hunting caribou in large numbers. And so there are thick beds of caribou bones. And it just shows the connection of people to that resource. What he also found was that in times when the caribou declined, they would switch resources. 
they would be doing more seal hunting. And I think that's an important lesson for uh, us in thinking about how people operate in these Arctic environments is the populations of the animals are unstable and people have to be prepared to uh, switch what they're harvesting uh, during, you know, that may go on for one person's whole lifetime. It may be an intensive focus on caribou, but then in the next generation, uh, people might be really switching to seals because the caribou have gone down considerably in population. Um, a big uh, emphasis in the book is on local uh, indigenous observations of uh, impacts on their communities uh, as a result of uh, climate cycles and especially climate warming right now. Uh, Merlin Kanuka is a whaling captain on St. Lawrence Island and his chapter is on observing marine mammals at Gamble uh, during the time of change. And uh, he, he said that, he says that our ice and weather have been changing lately and we have to change our hunting practices. Uh, and he was talking about in 2016, they had extremely poor walrus harvest uh, because the ice receded very early. And of course, walrus are found on the ice edge and with the ice um, receding very early and uh, coming back much later in the year, their opportunities for walrus hunting have greatly declined. And they also put themselves in danger because if they wanna go out for walrus, in, uh, they often have to travel across uh, long distances across the Bering Sea in their boats, in small boats, to get to the ice edge and where the walruses are, uh, which they know from looking at NOAA weather satellite data uh, and uh, satellite imagery but they're at risk because they're out in open water in these small boats. They don't have the ice floating around that they used to have to protect them from waves and storms. So it's riskier to hunt walrus. You have to travel farther. On the other hand, they're now hunting whales um, almost the whole year because the whales uh, are not ice dependent and they are now starting to uh, spend the entire uh, most months of the year around the island. And so they're, they've changed their emphasis. And it's a similar point to what people were doing in Greenland that uh, Morton Melgar was talking about. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, Merlin says the walrus are healthy from what they see. They're getting enough food, but they're in different places and they're much harder to obtain. Another uh, uh, chapter from the book is um, uh, Brenda Parley's chapter on uh, local knowledge of polar bear populations uh, in the Nubialiat region of Western Canada. Uh, so if you look on that uh, uh, chart to the left of the different polar bear subpopulations, uh, she's talking about SB area, so uh, the Southern Beaufort Sea area, uh, and this is the Nubialiat um, uh, settlement region. And uh, she, uh, she really starts off her paper by talking about the quote unquote polar bear crisis, which she does not think is real at all. That um, in fact, uh, polar bear, uh, the, to the total global polar bear population um, is actually, uh, is between 22 and 31,000 animals, the highest it's been ever in 60 years of scientific research. And uh, there's only one population that is on, in the decline. And her paper is about connecting uh, both the scientific knowledge of polar bears in this uh, southern Beaufort Sea region with very extensive local knowledge, people who've been hunting these bears for subsistence, uh, you know, for many, many generations. And uh, the, the problems and challenges of uh, integrating the, this sort of local knowledge and uh, indigenous ecology uh, with the scientific studies and to come down to uh, game management uh, solutions. And so that's just another, that's another theme in the book um, of connecting indigenous knowledge to uh, scientific studies. You know, another uh, avenue of research that's connected to Arctic crashes is uh, ADNA, so it stands for Ancient DNA, uh, this paper by Brenna uh, McLeod, 
um, is she's just uh, applying that to looking at historic populations of Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic walruses. And she, uh, and of course, with uh, DNA, ancient DNA is extracted from animal bones and uh, tissues. They use the mitochondrial DNA. And it's um, actually a very good method for the Arctic because DNA preserves much better in cold uh, conditions. And so you can look at DNA from even, you know, Pleistocene mammoths and other fairly ancient mammals, but also these historic populations. And her study of uh, uh, walruses, you know, um, realized some of the potential for this kind of research that where you can look at rates of evolution, the separation of subpopulations, and especially for bottlenecks in genetic diversity. So if, uh, if a population crashes, uh, there'll ju be just a few survivors and they represent just a portion of the genetic diversity of the whole population. Then if the population regrows from them, the resulting population will be much less genetically diverse than what was there before. And you can see those records, um, the, that evidence of these past crashes by studying the DNA, which is what she did for walrus. And um, she, I won't go into the details of her results, but she did show that the uh, special subpopulation of walruses in the Canadian Maritimes that were completely extirpated by commercial hunting for hides and blubber and tusks in the 19th century um, were, were formerly a distinct subspecies that had been entirely eliminated by hunting and thus over, overall reduced the uh, genetic diversity of, of the species. Uh, I'll, you know, Karen Mauger uh, did the same thing. There was this uh, ghost of caribou herds past. She connected her genetic data to lots of historical observations of caribou herds. And uh, in, in Alaska, there are many different herd subpopulations that go through these cycles that we saw uh, for Greenland, for example. And uh, she kind of tackled many problems or, or uh, observations. And one of the things she said that uh, from her data, these herds that were down on the Alaska Peninsula really crashed severely uh, enough to lose most of their genetic diversity. Whereas most of the other populations in Alaska have declined, but not been eliminated. And they've come back and still retain a lot of diversity. And she thinks that some of the reports of, you know, caribou crashes, uh, like from the 19th century, uh, often attributed to the, you know, introduction of firearms into Alaska, um, that those are actually probably not really true, that the animals simply shifted away from the ranges. They shifted their ranges and out of observation. And so um, it's a way of straightening out, you know, or reconciling historical data as well. So quite an interesting study. And then I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll talk a little bit about my chapter in the book, uh, which was looking at harbor seals in Southern Alaska. Uh, and here you see their range. And then these are all, the dots are all of their haul out locations. And they're also divided into several different uh, genetic stocks. And uh, of course, harbor seals have always been uh, tremendously important uh, for subsistence uh, in, in southern Alaska throughout their range. And this is just an illustration from a uh, <clears throat> current research project of mine in Yakutat Bay. And this is uh, looking at uh, Yakutat plinket seal hunting in the 18th century in the ice flows near, near Hubbard Glacier. Very, and this is a, you know, Yakutat is still one of the leading uh, communities in Alaska for consumption of harbor seals. But the, uh, the thing that, that, that struck me was uh, biologists observed uh, this unbelievable crash of harbor seals starting in the mid-1970s. And if you see, if you look on this sort of rough chart, uh, you can see the population crash there and the blue line on the top. And that little arrow shows more or less where biologists started observing this crash. And they said, there's a crash underway 
eventually resulted in a 80 or 90 percent decline of these different stocks uh, across southern Alaska. And um, my question or my hypothesis was that uh, there were probably a lot of things going on in this crash, but that overhunting that had uh, preceded this crash was responsible. And you see just indicated here uh, subsistence hunting on the bottom, which of course has been continuous through time. Uh, Alaska commercial company hunting, that was an early period of commercial hunting. Uh, commercial hunting really took off in the 1960s, hundreds of thousands of harbor seals were killed for their pelts because of fashion trends in Europe. And, uh, and there was also bounty hunting by the state of Alaska that considered seals to be pests and predators because they were eating, they thought they were eating too much salmon. And so I, I pulled together historical data on all of these uh, impacts on seals, subsistence, commercial hunting, bounty hunting, and uh, this is from a lot of Alaska Department of Fish and Game records and federal records of various kinds, and came up with this sort of uh, more refined analysis of what was going on with the seal populations. And this, uh, you see, in, uh, basically these lines are sort of error ranges, but show the same thing. Uh, two peaks of hunting, the one on the left in the late 19th century, early 1900s, it was a commercial a boom in hunting hair seals, including harbor seals. But then this huge peak of hunting in the 1960s, especially, and it shot up to uh, almost 300,000 animals uh, per four year period. And uh, what I showed in the paper was that this hunting exceeded the PBR. This is how the National Marine Fisheries Service calculates, well, how many animals can be taken from a population and have it be continuous, have it be sustainable, which is about 3% for harbor seals. And uh, so those lines see, if you had a million harbor seals out there, which I think is a likely estimate, <clears throat> uh, that's the bottom blue, you know, horizontal line, you can see this peak crossed well over that line uh, and could have caused the crash. If you had 2 million seals out there, um, it would even cross the PBR for that uh, level of, of uh, harvesting. So there's no doubt in my mind that this was the cause of the crash. The interesting thing is why haven't they recovered since 1972 and the Marine Mammal Protection Act when all of these uh, commercial hunting, bounty hunting was ended. And I think that has to do with these climate cycles in the North Pacific. Uh, we've been in a warm cycle and that's been bad for the kind of fish that seals eat. So a mixed explanation. So I would say uh, that some takeaway concepts from our project. Um, one is the importance of natural climate cycles on multiple time scales. You know, taking those into account, that's kind of the background. We understand those go way back in time. Uh, the effects that those climate natural climate cycles have on food chains, animal populations, and shifting range of animals. Uh, then we have a you know, sort of global circumpolar disruption by anthropogenic climate warming, which is causing effects such as what they're observing on St. Lawrence Island with the loss of sea ice and uh, declining access to walruses. <clears throat> we have something that really cannot be overestimated. It's the major and extended impacts of commercial overhunting that started in some places in, the, in Canada in the 17th century, but certainly continued almost all the way through the 20th century. Everything from uh, wall, you know, whaling, of course we're aware of the whaling industry, but also decimation of walrus herds, caribou, all of these uh, suffered from commercial hunting impacts. And I would say also we learned, uh, this comes out in many, many papers in the volume, that use of these resources by indigenous communities is sustainable. It's always been at a low enough level to very rarely have any impact on animal populations. You can find a few cases like the sea cow and the great auk where it seems they seem to have lost some of their populations by pre-contact indigenous overhunting. 
but those are rare. For the most part, the real impacts have been from these industrial scale animal uh, harvesting. And, and finally, the importance of studying crashes at the local scale with local knowledge because subpopulations have different histories and we can learn a lot about those individual histories from the people who live in these areas combined with uh, all records of other kinds, genetic, etc. So that's just a quick run through. Uh, I, I think that the primary relevance to this, uh, this interest group is that um, it, it gives us some insights into uh, the way people um, in the North have used the environment, have always used the environment and the resources and their, their uh, impact as compared to the impacts of, uh, you know, uh, globalization, imperialism, everything, the whole takeover of the North by the South. And that has had a much larger impact in many, many ways. So thank you for uh, listening in on this. <clears throat> and uh, really, I, I'm happy for questions. I, I think that's part of this as well. Yes, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and yeah, Dorothy, do you have anything you want to start out with? Well, I was just wondering, Erin, um, I learned during the week that um, I think your co-editor, Igor Krupnik, also has another book that's just coming out, Indigenous Knowledge for Climate Change Assessment and Adaptation. Can you say something about that, or would that be a good presentation that we might want to consider for a future meeting? Yeah, I, I think you should invite Igor to talk about that. Um, he has done uh, a lot of work in this area, uh, especially in uh, the Bering Sea region, Chukotka and St. Lawrence Island and uh, Northern Alaska, and uh, really documenting local knowledge observations. And uh, this includes both kind of current and ongoing but also oral traditions uh, about changes in the past. And that's something I've always been interested in as well. Uh, and so, yes, I think that would be, would be really interesting. And that has been, uh, he's always been interested in how you do connect uh, the way scientists observe these populations, the way they think about them, the way game managers think about them, as opposed to the way local people perceive uh, animal populations and uh, manage them within their own um, understanding of the of the ecology. So yes, I think you should have Igor. He could certainly expand on on this uh, very well. It just seemed to go nicely with what you're talking about as well. And and um, I really appreciate your presentation. It's very very interesting work. Yeah, I, 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 it was very, uh, I guess that was a pretty compressed presentation. I was, I just put it together. I wasn't sure how much time it would take. Um, I, I would, maybe I could say a couple more words about this uh, Yakutat work. That has been extremely interesting because that is in a uh, situation, Yakutat Bay has been a place where the glaciers have retreated over the last 900 years and kind of opened up this whole deep water fjord as a human habitat and as an animal habitat. It's very, very uh, ecologically diverse. The harbor seals are abundant there along with all these other species. And, uh, and people are just this continuity of um, uh, reliance on those resources up to the present day. And so the, the opportunity in the community was to look at oral tradition, archeology, span the geology of the retreating glaciers and you know, trying to uh, see where they were at different times. The fjord ecology, um, glaciers create their own very interesting marine ecology because they're putting so many sediments into the, uh, into the water and that supports the food chain. Uh, and then uh, the present day knowledge of seals, we we're able to interview and talk with a lot of seal hunters and elders uh, about their understanding of this whole ecosystem and how it works. And so it was an example of uh, 
looking at essentially 900 or 1,000 years of indigenous knowledge and, um, and practice. And uh, that included some um, finding archeological sites uh, that are, represent old sealing camps and looking at the faunal remains from those camps. And so just a tremendous amount of information from different disciplines. And I do, I do think maybe, maybe that's something that uh, anthropologists are good at is um, uh, really collaborating on different viewpoints and specialties. Uh, both cross-culturally and then in an interdisciplinary way with our colleagues in uh, biology and uh, ethno-history and uh, lots of other fields. Are there other questions for Aaron? Uh, this is Sarah. I this maybe this is a, a not a correct question. I'm sorry um, if it is. But does the book have any chapters on the impacts of these crashes that um, that are um, sort of across the board unique for subsistence hunters, or does it? I mean, you've mentioned some of the impacts of having to switch from mm -hmm. one food source to another, but is, is there a kind of a concluding chapter on, on the, the overall impacts to communities and their health and well-being? Um, not, not so directly, not, not to, um, uh, the, the health and well-being question so much. It, it's, uh, it's more of an historical look about how people have dealt with these situations uh, in the past. And I, I did mention uh, switching to different resources, but that also involves mobility. And uh, mo most often you have to move to a different place if you're gonna focus on a different resource. And that we find lots of, of evidence of that too. And I think it's a quandary for uh, current communities that because they are now the type of housing that people have now and just all of the infrastructure, schools and uh, uh, public health infrastructure, et cetera, that are in their communities, uh, people, you can't, it's very difficult and expensive to move a village. And so you have a situation where people are fixed in one spot as the resources around them change. And I think that most certainly has uh, impacts on uh, their food security uh, and uh, and general health. Um, if important resources decline, you know, um, on Saint Lawrence Island, with this, uh, Merlin Kanuka certainly talks about this in terms of his community on Saint Lawrence Island, where uh, not having access to walruses or having that severely reduced is a crisis for them, uh, and. Uh, uh, they fortunately they've been able to find other things to hunt, but that's um, uh, it's a real difficulty. It's also a, a danger, as I mentioned, because they're they're more at risk to be doing this new kind of hunting. So I think uh, maybe that's another book, uh, and uh, would make a would would be a, a really good way to go, uh, looking at contemporary communities and how these types of changes are impacting them now. Yeah, I, cer I, I certainly think it would be interesting to have um, the coastal, we have a coastal resilience team. I think I saw Amy Holman was on this call who chairs, uh, yeah, she chairs um, that committee. Um, this type of information being conveyed and putting it in the con this historical information in context of what they're going through today um, would be extremely interesting. And you know, the impact of bird die-offs that are happening now. I, I just, this is very interesting. I think we need to think about how we can use this in a, in a productive way. Well, especially since the, the changes that are happening now in the Bering Sea are so startling and rapid, uh, just even in the couple years that this book has been 
in production and you know writing and in press now uh, so much has happened the accelerated warming and of the of the water and as you mentioned bird die-offs and it's just uh, you know looking like a train wreck and uh, I think one one you do get a perspective from this type of study, from this type of book, of what it's looked like in the past when things like this have happened. Now, you know, interestingly enough, the the level of global warming that we're experiencing now is really pretty similar to the way we were in about, uh, you know, AD uh, 1200 uh, during the medieval warm period. Uh, there was quite substantial warming and that had big effects on the food chain, on, on people. This is not something that's totally unprecedented, what, what people have to go through now. But I think what's different is that they have a whole different set of um, technology uh, and, uh, uh, you know, constraints. I mean, we, we think of modern technology as being very liberating in a way, um, but uh, it's also constrained because um, people can't move easily. Um, hey everybody, I'm really fascinated by this discussion, but I have to point out that it's time to move on to Valeria's talk because I want her to have her full 10 minutes. Excellent. So maybe Thank you for the Aaron, opportunity. While you're clicking the stop share button on the top right, um, I can direct you guys to continue the discussion on the IARPIC website. We have a comment section on every post that would be a great place to keep talking about this. And so Valeria, when you're ready, you can click your share button down in the bottom center. Um, hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great, and uh, we see your slides. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everybody, once again. Um, my presentation is uh, going to be about, the, a bit of uh, about a bit of a different topic that you um, probably used to discuss. It's about uh, completely something different. It's about media portrayal of the Arctic science and uh, the core problem that I have identified in this portrayal. So, um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Valeria. I, have, uh, I was born and grew up in Russia and uh, I have um, uh, been always interested in journalism, mass media, mass communication and representation in media. And uh, I have graduated from the uh, University of, uh, from uh, the Department of Journalism of the Moscow State University. And later on, my boss uh, has uh, proposed me to become an editor in chief of the website about the Arctic region. So I, I didn't know about Arctic much before uh, that. And uh, I, ha I hadn't been in Arctic. And because for me, it was too remote, too expensive to travel too far away and too unknown. But uh, later on, as I started as an editor at this website, I have discovered that the Arctic region is, um, even though it's remote, it's, uh, it's a very, first of all, it's a very beautiful place. And uh, there are some people living there and uh, animals, and it has an enormous impact on uh, the global climate patterns uh, and therefore even though the website where I was working had to be closed because of the crisis I was already I I was already infected with this Arctic interest so after a few years I ended up in Finland studying Arctic representations in media in uh, Finnish Lapland and after a while I uh, moved to Iceland to do polar law program. So, um, uh, what? Um, so, my thesis and my idea, uh, my thesis was aiming to uh, compare 
uh, the Arctic representations in three global media and to figure out how the Arctic is portrayed in the global arena. I know that there are a lot of uh, websites that uh, there are a lot of local websites that concentrate on the local life, on the life of local people in the Arctic. And I know that there are some websites that concentrate specifically on the Arctic region as a region. But my goal was to explore how Arctic is uh, presented to the widest possible public, how it is portrayed uh, on the global arena and what can be changed in this portrayal. So I have taken three websites of three global media, BBC, Al Jazeera and Russia Today, uh, RT, former Russia Today. So these three media represent the dominant flow and, of information and contra flow. So BBC representing the Western sort of point of view and Al Jazeera and RT representing some sort of contra flow, so uh, different to Western point of view. So I, my, I know that it's difficult to be objective in this kind of research, but I was trying to be as objective as I could. So I've decided to uh, take all the articles that have the word Arctic in them during one year and to uh, apply content analysis to identify the frames used to portray the Arctic. So the first stage of my research was to um, categorize all those, all the, uh, this whole volume of articles that I have found. And therefore I created some sort of a protocol that helped me to identify, uh, categorize those articles. So uh, these are pretty standard um, categories that are used in this kind of analysis, such as medium, date, length, section of the website, as well as um, there are some categories that I have created. For example, reference to Arctic. Arctic is mentioned uh, with variables, Arctic is mentioned and Arctic plays an important role. So um, I've decided to seed out all those articles where Arctic was just mentioned and concentrate on all those articles wh where Arctic plays an important role, where Arctic is an actor, where it is a region. And uh, the next category is topic. So for me, it was important to ident identify the context in which Arctic is mentioned. So I, um, after reading all those you know, books about Arctic region, talking to my scientific advisor, reading all those um, articles myself, I have identified all those topics that um, are used in, uh, when, uh, when in the articles about Arctic region. And there, there is another topic additional. It was, I have created this one because it was sometimes too difficult to use only one topic. So I've decided to create a second one just in case if it's too difficult for me to decide which topic to give to an article. So, and then it's gender uh, and illustration and I'm going to talk about this later. So, um, sorry. <laughs> So what I would like uh, first to point out that these are the main topic, uh, the topic main in all the articles, the most, imp uh, the most used topics in the articles about the Arctic region. So the, the first one, the most um, used one is the oil and gas extraction. So Arctic is usually mentioned in relation to oil and gas extraction. Then it's military, then it's climate, policy making, cooperation and research, and many others that are too small to talk about now. So um, I'm now going to concentrate on the science in these articles, because I think that it would be the most interesting part of my research for you. So science, is, um, science in the Arctic is usually mentioned uh, in relation to either cooperation and research and climate. So I have decided now to concentrate on this segment of my research to present it to you. So what, uh, uh, so how the work of scientists is portrayed in media. Uh, the um, interesting thing for me was that climate seemed to be uh, the most popular way to introduce the work of scientists. 
science always goes in connection to climate. Science in the Arctic is not interested per se or in connection to the people living there. It's mostly the tool to solve the problems in climate. Uh, I have also noticed that the international cooperation of um, scientists in the Arctic is almost non-existent in global media as well as the traditional knowledge is almost never, uh, never mentioned. So um, the core problem of uh, science in the Arctic represented in media is that it's given a very limited and one-sided attention. The core problem is the lack of human dimension, as I call it. So what is the human dimension? First of all, um, let's look at this graph. Um, I would like to point out that all news in the world are written because something happened. Something has to happen in order for the journalist to decide to write about this. And in, I've noticed uh, that when we're talking about science in the Arctic, in many cases, uh, the articles are based on retelling the research. So research was published, article is written, and article is mostly about the research itself, uh, how journalists understand it with some few comments of the scientists. Uh, there is a very limited amount of articles uh, written um, through the field work or expedition or in-depth interviews or features. So this problem I would call the limited amount of in-depth articles featuring local problems in the Arctic. If we look at this in a broader way, um, journalists mostly concentrate on something which is what is going on outside of Arctic. So research, uh, researchers, are, research are usually published outside of the Arctic. Uh, some officials talking about Arctic outside of the Arctic. And there is limited attention to the problems of the Arctic people that, uh, as a starting point. So um, if it's a bit difficult to understand what I'm talking about, I would like to show you um, an ideal example, in my opinion, how the um, Arctic, uh, how the uh, science in the Arctic can be introduced. So Al Jazeera has done it. They um, talked to reindeer herders in the northern Norway, and uh, the article starts with the experience of the reindeer herders and how they experience climate change. And later on, it's sort of backed up by the scientific research and the opinion of the scientists. So this, in my opinion, is a very good way to introduce scientific research. So it's interesting for the readers and it's um, very true in connection, uh, in relation to the local people. Um, another thing that I've noticed is what I call the voices of the Arctic. So the thing is that um, there are very little amount of comments of uh, people who live in the Arctic when we talk about scientific research. Uh, let's, I have counted all those comments in all those articles about science, uh, related to the science in the Arctic, and people are not talking much <laughs> in these articles. So as you can see, these are 10 comments, and four of them are actually in that article that I showed you four of them. So mostly um, we're talking about uh, the comments of representatives of indigenous organizations and or cultural organizations. And as you can see, Al Jazeera is doing uh, quite well compared to BBC and RT. And this is the proof that you can be non-Arctic global media and still uh, be and still do very well in representing um, local people in the Arctic. Um, so I would call this problem the limited amount of comments from the locals. And another thing is um, the lack of visual representation of people. Um, yeah, of course we have, a, a, um, the main illustration is mostly the illustration of nature. And uh, I'll talk about this later. And also the illustration about and then it's like man-made objects. But, so, but the thing is that 
uh, I understand if you write an article about the reindeer herding problems, then you would probably want to illustrate this with reindeer herders and reindeers and reindeer and something, you know, if you write about polar bear, you polar bear research, you would probably illustrate this with polar bear picture. But the thing is that um, there is a very huge problem that I call an empty icy snowy landscapes. The thing is that uh, always when talking about Arctic, journalists have this snowy, empty, icy landscapes in mind. I specifically, uh, I've chosen some examples and these examples are um, aiming to illustrate that the headline of the article may not relate to what they put as a main picture. This main picture is basically their idea of the Arctic. So probably the journalist saw the word frosty in the headline here and therefore he has decided to put some icy landscape as a main picture. Or uh, here we talk about Arctic and then he decided that probably polar bear has to go as a main picture because it's Arctic. <laughs> and the picture, uh, I mentioned here the uh, pictures of people as well, but I, would, I want to show you what kind of people can end up as a main picture. So, um, first of all, we have some officials from Washington who um, happen to visit Arctic. And it's, it's nothing bad because it, it, the headline is about Obama, so why not to put Obama? But this is just an example of, um, how Arctic sometimes is visually represented by the politicians who live outside of Arctic, who never been to Arctic or who've been one time in their life. So uh, here we see some polar researchers and I would uh, personally like to see more research, uh, scientists doing research in the Arctic as a representation of, uh, as a visual representation of Arctic, but uh, we don't see, we almost uh, don't see uh, local people there and how they are affected by the um, climate change and their faces and stuff. And as you can see on the pictures, the people are quite small, they're turning backs to, towards the viewers and, you know, it's not really representing the, world of, uh, the work of scientists in the Arctic. Uh, so uh, I know that uh, you all are uh, very experienced scientists who um, work in the Arctic and uh, I would uh, like you maybe to participate in the discussion of how we can, um, how we as, uh, how scientists can uh, actually help this representation. So I think it's, uh, in my opinion, it's um, very important to build relationships and uh, if a journalist once calls you about some research, so, and if you know some people who um, are willing to talk, uh, if you know some local people, some indigenous people who are willing to talk to the journalist about their experience, and if it's appropriate, so maybe it's good to uh, share the contact and sort of encourage journalists to talk about their experience as well. It's not that journalists don't care about uh, the Arctic and the local people representation. It's just they don't know, and there are there can be some barriers as well. They don't. They may not have contacts. They there can be some language barrier in some case. So I think it's important to connect and to stress out the importance and the value of the research for the local people and how it's been affect how uh, how the problem that you've been studying has affected their life. And also, I think it's important as well to stress out the traditional knowledge, the role of traditional knowledge in the research. Uh, and I know that tradition, the traditional knowledge is, a, is, the importance of traditional knowledge is widely discussed nowadays in scientific community and in, with IRP as well. And maybe it also can be translated uh, into the work of, uh, into the work with the journalists. So these are my thoughts, but I would like to encourage you to participate in a small discussion on this topic. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Valeria. I know we're over time, but um, I did want to point out um, the Coastal Resilience Collaboration Team 
is organizing a meeting on just this topic because I know scientists themselves have a hard time connecting to people who live in the Arctic. And so it could be even harder for them to connect journalists to those limited contacts. But mm -hmm. I think this is a topic that's of great interest to the IARBIC community in the Arctic research community, and I'm glad that the Coastal Resilience team is going to organize a meeting to discuss just this. Maybe, Meredith, you could fill in a little more details if there are any. I know it's maybe not scheduled yet. Yeah, I think we're going to wait on um, sharing that information until we have a more firm plan, but yeah, these types of conversations are coming up more and more. And Valeria, I would point you to a book um, called Fierce Climate, Sacred Ground by Beth Marino. She explores this topic in um, a book on community relocation and how the media portrays communities um, having to relocate. And yeah, it's a more focused um, dive, but it might be of interest to you. Thank you. Any other questions for Valeria? Well, I personally am fascinated by the research that you're doing, and I think it's really important to think about how the Arctic is portrayed to the rest of the world. So I really thank you for bringing this topic to the research community. So thank you, Valeria, and thanks to everybody for sticking around for another 15 minutes. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a very interesting meeting. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, also, I sent you a little question. Maybe we can talk offline. Oh. Okay, an email or how did you send it? No, in the chat box. Oh, chat, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. Uh, wonder what as well about the impact on human uh, populations. Yeah. Oh, if you I, have, as an archaeologist, you may be able to layer animal and human populations, and I was just wondering if there were human yeah. population crashes. Well, you know, the... Uh, the historic human population story in Alaska is most affected most affected by the historic epidemics, you know, of uh, that are still going on. But you know, we're just ravaged all the way from uh, in Alaska, from you know the Russian contact period all the way through, you know, measles and tuberculosis, etc. So we we definitely see those kinds of impacts. We also see, um, uh, I think you know, it's hard to tell sometimes whether you, if you see a reduction archaeologically, whether people have just moved away or whether they have really mm -hmm. suffered. Yeah. We know, for example, of famines in um, from oral tradition and archaeology as well. It's terrible famines in Alaska, for example, in St. Lawrence Island in 1878, 79, mm -hmm. lost maybe a thousand people, at least two thirds of the population of the island. Uh, there was another, just a couple years later, there was a big famine in North Alaska that, uh, you know, doesn't, that wasn't disease related. It seems to have been related to the uh, possibly caribou population crash in that area. So we can, we can trace this. We can look back and see these consequences of cycling of animal abundance. And sometimes it can have a devastating effect. Uh, but you know, we also see the the disease impacts, which were, you know, which were terrible. You know, reductions of dramatic reductions, where you might lose eight out of ten people. To yeah, so much greater than much greater than the food source crash. I think so. I think people had you know long term uh, ways of dealing with, you know, the, such a thorough understanding of the environment. Uh, 
ways of coping, whether that meant moving, sw uh, switching to a different uh, type of food or different strategy, different hunting strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also, um, you know, there are natural disasters that affect people like volcanic eruptions and glacial advances. And we see people moving out of areas. And then uh, I would say, I, I've always thought of it as kind of moving in with your allies or your, uh, that you may be, you know, connected with through intermarriage and trade. And uh, so you, you, you go to a wider support network. Thank you for that. Thank you for that information. Then. Yeah. Yeah. No, great topic. I, I'd like the, uh, I think there's all kinds of fascinating connections between this and the question of, you know, community well-being for sure. 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 Yeah, I, I do too. So it's, it's a, a lot to think about. Fertile ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's nice to meet you and uh, to meet everyone involved. And I look forward to future uh, IARPIC uh, uh, discussions. I'm going to, when it, when it becomes available, I think I'll, I'd love to join that coastal resilience discussion. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I didn't say anything more specific because I think um, they're having an indigenous only meeting first um, uh -huh. to discuss issues and then that information will be shared out with a wider community um yeah. yeah oh is that the samsa study is that the samsa work that uh angela talked about no um this is kind of a meeting on navigating the new arctic and how that process unfolded mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah separate okay thank you uh, it's, it's about how um researchers go about making contacts with people who live in the Arctic to do co-production. Um, but I think navigating the new Arctic required that in their proposals. And there was a little dissatisfaction from the indigenous and local communities on how scientists went about it. So I, I think the meeting will be important for Valeria's work too, because it will help, mm -hmm. uh, it will help the community establish some best practices for um, working with communities in a respectful, it's respectful and equitable way. Do you, think, do you think that describes the issue, Meredith? Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. Yeah, Valeria's work is, is really interesting. It's, uh, it's interesting. I hadn't thought of how, how the Arctic is portrayed, but that certainly is a um, mm -hmm. compelling way to look at it in a compelling area. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Yeah.